Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I had just moved into my new house in a quiet suburban neighborhood. It was my first time owning property, and I was excited to finally have a place to call my own. On my first day, I went over to introduce myself to my new neighbors. That's when I met Karen from the Homeowners Association's board. She gave me a fake smile and said, Welcome to our neighborhood. I got bad vibes from her, but just brushed it off. The Homeowners Association seemed pretty strict, but nothing too crazy at first. Just some minor rules about fence heights and lawn care. Annoying, but manageable. Then the harassment from Karen started. She would come over unannounced and inspect my property for violations, even coming into my backyard without permission. I started finding fake violation notices on my door for things like having a garden gnome or wind chimes. I went to an homeowners association's meeting to complain about Karen's behavior. That's when I realized she was on a major power trip. She acted like she owned the whole neighborhood and that everyone had to obey her every command. The other board members just went along with whatever Karen said. Things escalated when I got a notice that my house was going to be auctioned off because I was delinquent on homeowners association's dues. I knew this had to be a mistake. I went directly to Karen's house to confront her. Karen smugly told me, Your house no longer belongs to you. It's being auctioned off next week for non-payment of dues. I told Karen there must be a mix-up because I was fully paid up. She said, The decision has been made. This is what happens when you don't follow homeowners association's rules. I asked to see proof I owed anything. Karen refused to show me any documentation saying, the board voted and the decision is final. I was panicking. This made absolutely no sense. I pulled up my bank statements showing I'd paid. Karen accused me of forging documents. She said, those could be fabricated. The board has all the official records. I called my real estate lawyer who assured me this was illegal. We sent a certified letter to the homeowners association's board demanding proof of any unpaid dues and warning against any auction of my home. Karen ignored the letter and continued planning the auction. She even put up a sign in my front yard saying my house was for sale. On auction day, Karen was grinning like the Cheshire Cat. She announced, The bidding for this house will start at $50,000. I interrupted and loudly told the gathered crowd, This auction is fraudulent. I'm the legal owner and I have not authorized any sale. Karen screamed at me to leave immediately. I stood my ground and said, I'm calling the police to halt this criminal activity and sue anyone who tries to bid on my property. Karen got flustered but proceeded with the auction. A few people tried bidding but stopped when I showed them my deed and warned I'd press charges. Finally Karen shouted, Fine, if none of you cowards want to bid, then I'll buy it myself for the minimum $50,000. I said, Your purchase is invalid. I have legal rightful ownership. Karen screamed, The house is mine now. I'll have you evicted for trespassing. She tried calling the police, but they informed her this was a civil matter, not criminal. The next day, Karen showed up with a moving truck, ready to take over my house. I had a sheriff's officer stand guard while the restraining order against Karen was finalized. In court, Karen again claimed she owned my home fair and square. She said the auction was legal and I owed her $50,000 or else vacate the premises immediately. I presented my deed, bank records showing paid dues, and email proof that Karen fabricated the entire auction scheme. The judge asked Karen, On what grounds did you initiate this fraudulent auction? Karen responded, We have authority as an homeowners association's board to collect dues by any means necessary. I was just trying to take control of this rule breaker's home. The judge lectured Karen that homeowners associations cannot illegally auction and seize property without overwhelming evidence of unpaid debts, which she failed to produce. He ordered Karen to rescind any claim to my house, cease all contact with me, and pay $5,000 for my legal fees. She screamed, this is outrageous, but had no choice but to comply. Justice was served. The Homeowners Association's board members turned against Karen and removed her from office once they realized her shady behavior could expose them to legal liability. Last I heard, Karen was still sulking from her humiliation and threatening to sue the whole neighborhood for conspiring against her. But nobody pays her any mind anymore. For now, I'm just relieved to have that deranged homeowners association's Karen out of my life. She almost stole my house right from under me. But I'm not about to let someone like that intimidate me again.
the sweet taste of victory sure feels good. And the deed firmly in my name is the icing on the cake. The next one is a pro-revenge story. I, F-48, have known Pat, F-48, for decades. As far as I can remember, she was fixated on having five children and a picket fence dream life. I slowly cut ties with her in college because she was an opportunist and I didn't trust her. She is both manipulative and forceful. Her idea of cute rubs me the wrong way. Pat likes to walk like a penguin when she wants to elicit pity, and she usually does this when she wants to evoke the underdog narrative. I've never seen someone act so despicable and ridiculous at the same time. I moved on with my life. Happily got rid of her for years. Pat eventually found me on Facebook. I accepted her friend request out of politeness. Pat has become the epitome of a permissive mother. Her five kids do as they please and she never calls them out. She tried to force a relationship between me and her daughters and made them call me auntie. Pat tried to drop them at my house uninvited. Her phone calls were insistent. She tried to monopolize my time and she began to show up at my job. I created some boundaries so she tried to find loopholes. It was a nightmare. My husband and I hosted a party for the community center, not the real name, new members. The community center is actually a very informal initiative, and my husband and I mainly serve the homeless population. We prefer to help strangers instead of catering to potentially narcissistic acquaintances. We don't mind lending a hand, but we have encountered truly dishonest choosing beggars. There are other services, like one of the members who helps women get their wedding and prom dresses for free. The community center location headquarters is actually a farm owned by an elderly couple. There is a barn, a venue, and a very nice green field with an artificial lake and some fowl. They charge for the use of their facilities, weddings, etc., but not for community-oriented stuff. Pat had always been salty at her husband for demanding that she go back to work after Baby Hash 3. In the meantime, he worked three jobs. She demanded he get her pregnant to fulfill her dream of having five kids. He didn't agree because he was already nearly 45 and felt like he might never be able to retire. She got away with bringing new babies into this world anyway. Her fascination with being pregnant comes from all the attention she gets. She had at least one miscarriage in between each kid. Pat latched on to our group. She never missed any of our activities. I hated having her in my house, but it was an open invitation that included virtually everyone, and she was very active as an event organizer. I didn't like the way her kids behaved. We have a designated area for parties and entertainment, but her kids ended up inside my bedroom. We ended up having to keep watch of them and enjoyed zero of our own party. I called her days later to get my point across regarding their overall behavior, but she completely cut me off and began talking about herself and said her kids wanted to come visit again and use our pool. I never answered that. I didn't want to say, no, I will not have your brats over. She also called me as Summer was approaching specifically to let me know her middle daughter was bored and wanted to spend a week at our home. I politely declined, citing that me and my husband have to work and cannot entertain guests. Pat paid no heed. Her kid called me on the weekend calling me auntie and attempted to coax me by saying, Mom says you invited me to spend summer with you. I quickly clarified and offered an explanation to avoid hurting a kid's self-esteem. Never mind. Her daughter just hung up on me. Pat's Facebook also showed some red flags. Some cryptic rants here and there were visible, along with friends' comments and complaints on how she asked a particular person to watch her kids only for a couple of hours and ended up leaving them all day. Another of her friends criticized her girls' night out, because Pat had just asked them to be patient and wait until she could pay back some money that she owed them, yet she had money to spend on Friday night outings. I thought those very public comments on private matters were more like a cry of lost patience. Unpleasant things began to happen. Like the time she volunteered to wrap the ex mas presents for underprivileged kids. We all wanted to create a mix of less costly gifts with really nice ones. Surprisingly, some nice and eye-catching toys and games went missing but turned up under her Christmas tree, courtesy of her mother-in-law's FB posts. No one could prove anything, but it was hate-inducing or the time my daughter called me in tears to pick her up after she attended Pat's daughter's birthday, Casey. My daughter had been ignored all night because she didn't gift her the expensive gaming stuff Casey practically demanded. My daughter did ask, but I said no. We would buy her a very nice and thoughtful present according to her taste. So when I went to pick her up, my daughter was sitting alone in the living room while Casey and her friends stayed outside. Stories about Pat and her family multiplied, 
The owners at the farm, community center, decided keep there their gates locked unless they had guests or events, because Pat got in the habit of driving in whenever she pleased, and it was either her kids screaming and disturbing ongoing weddings, throwing rocks at the koi in the lake, or harassing the geese in the yard, or how she stiffed another soccer mom with the lunch bill and then pulled the struggling financially card, or how other parents hated her because she created unnecessary hostile competition. When my daughter turned 13, I allowed her to wear my grandma's ring. It's not an expensive piece of jewelry, but it's vintage and girls nowadays want to look boho. My granny gave it to me when I became a teenager so I passed it on to my kids so she could wear it on her birth week. It was weird that she became quiet and distracted after that. She also didn't want to go to school and my husband and I became suspicious. She never opened up and my other kids had no clue. We went to her school but her teachers assured us nothing had changed in her environment. My husband and I suspected she was being bullied, but our kid gave us no tools to support her. My kid is very sunny and very compassionate. She has never had any problems with other kids. I called her best friend's mom. Natalie, my kid's BFF, told us what was going on. Casey, Pat's eldest, and my daughter had become close. I knew this and wasn't too thrilled. I found the age, Casey was 17 gap, not exactly inappropriate, but I'd rather see my daughter spend time with friends in the same age range. Casey is very beautiful and a gifted student. She is also very conceited. To make the story short, she asked my daughter if she could try on the ring and refused to give it back. She later claimed that she lost it but would look for it, so my daughter was distraught. My daughter kept asking for her ring, and as a result, Casey shunned her and spread the word that my kid was trying to steal her ring. Some kids at school took Casey's side, so now Casey just wore my kid's jewelry to school like nothing happened. If that doesn't qualify as taunting, I don't know what does. My guilt comes from not being able to get my daughter to open up and feel safe telling me the truth. I talked to her and she burst into tears. I was both pained as a mother and furious that some teenage bitch was doing this under our noses. I went straight to Pat's car after school. I asked to talk as Casey was about to go in. So I grabbed Casey's hand and asked to see her jewelry. Casey froze and she tried to make a fist, so I became relentless. Casey yelled, Mom! And Pat struggled to get out of the car. I slid the ring off. Casey has tiny hands and wore the ring on her index finger. First Pat yelled at me. After I confronted her with the engraving on the band, my grandma's maiden name, she argued it was loaned to her daughter by my kid. Then she said she bought it. I paid no heed. I did warn them that I knew Casey had become an abusive friend to my daughter. Pat called me to tell me off. She said she was trying to raise an assertive young woman and I had just messed that up by being overbearing. She never apologized for her thief of a child. Pat's husband, Hank, is what can be described as a doormat. Pat wore him down to a knob. He had no choice but to obey her to keep the peace. She was a bully who actively withdrew affection when he didn't follow her wishes. Even in public. So she got kids hash four and hash five after a relentless campaign that included leaving him for two months. Her pregnancies were a nuisance because she expected to be treated like the only lady who has even been pregnant. She strolled around in a wheelchair almost immediately after getting pregnant, and she would get very sick on weekends, so her kids were often sent to friends and family so that she could rest. Pat systematically bullied Hank. She would leave town and take the kids with her. Poor Hank would look distraught drinking on his porch, or just looking really lonely. This is how she got off the hook and was able to leave her job. Hank had virtually no voice, so he struggled to keep the marriage together. Everyone liked him, but hated her equally. Hank loved to talk to other people, but seemed concerned that Pat would be upset. Over time, according to my husband, Hank began to show signs of depression and mental distress. Our friend, Lena, runs the wedding prom dress initiative. It's not complicated. Dresses are sourced from donations, eBay, trunk shows, etc. Unusually beautiful dresses are retained so that more than one bride gets to wear them. In some cases, a bride will pay 50 bucks, but most of the time, the dresses are donated to the bride. Pat was involved in this. Lena kept her in because they never had any issues, and her task was limited to just shipping the dresses out. Pat decided to renew her vows, and her bridezilla Karenzilla attitude became the icing on the cake. For starters, she bullied another couple into giving up their wedding date at the farm because she needed her renewal to match her exact wedding date. They were not impressed with her harassment. 
so they booked another venue. As a result, the farm owners were pissed because Pat was already costing them money after she had successfully negotiated a cut in their rate because she couldn't afford it but will repay by doing maintenance work around the venue. She never made good on her word. Pat became attached to a particular dress that was already assigned to another bride. Lena made it clear that she would need to pay for her own dress, so Pat played it cool and shipped the wrong gown instead. She was adamant that it was the right dress, despite all the notes on Leah's agenda. The other bride was truly gracious about it. She was obviously disappointed, but never made a scene. What bothered me most is that I picked that dress and bought it for 40 bucks at a garage sale. Not my money, Leah's money. It was a vintage dress, ankle-length, white with lots of lace and a huge bargain. Again, when confronted, Pat did a Casey and used the this-is-mine strategy. We felt so bad for the other bride that we did our best to get her something nice to wear. The other bride was a true fighter. She had pulled out of welfare, earned her high school diploma, and was working to get on her feet by trying to earn a certificate as an acrylic nail technician. So her reward was to have some Karen steal her dress? Pat never admitted to messing up, but just by the fact that she claimed it was her dress we knew. Lena never allowed her in her warehouse again. Their last phone fight ended with Pat bringing up the other bride's past, like it mattered. And, this conversation is over, it's my dress and you are mistaken. That was weeks before the other bride's wedding. Pat went all out on her wedding decor. She spent way too much. She hired a caterer for some food, mainly mimosas and appetizers, but the wedding invitation included a request for specific dishes for her Sunday brunch wedding. Either she ran out of banquet money or was on a complete moocher mode. I picture the penguin walking upon, practically asking everyone to supply her wedding reception grub, and I cringe. There is nothing wrong with potluck weddings. In fact, they can be a nice addition to a very cozy and family-oriented wedding reception. But don't you need to at least be close to your guests in order to ask for such a thing? Even I got an invitation. I told everyone I wasn't going because I was very uncomfortable being told what to bring, and was probably expected to give them a cash gift on top of that. Some of the older ladies in our group agreed. Some said they would not decline in advance because she is a bully and they didn't want a confrontation. Lena called me the night before Pat's re-wedding. Lena was there to close the Saturday night bingo, and Pat was awfully friendly, but that's what she does whenever things are going her way. Lena peeked into the garment bag and saw the exact same dress while Pat was caught up supervising the wedding decoration. The thing with Karens is that they expect everyone to suck it up, or make their dreams come true, or they simply underestimate everyone and think we are all fools. Lena is a very straightforward person with a so-sue-me attitude. She told me she would just ruin the dress. After all, it was hers, so she could do whatever she wanted. If Pat wanted to take legal action, and should things get ugly, she needed to prove ownership. However, the dress was the same. The marks inside the hem and the tags were the same. Even the tag numbers that were punched to identify each dress for logistics purposes matched. Pat had the dress altered, with some extra beading and dyed to a deep cream color. But it was obviously the same garment. Lena and I snuck in before the venue was closed for the night. All brides are allowed to stay in a small bedroom for a small charge, so that they don't need to drive in on their wedding day. Honestly, the makeshift chapel was gorgeous. I don't know how she paid for it, but it was full of flowers and presumptuous details. I naively brought in some ink to spill on the dress, but Lena said she wanted something more awful, like a nasty surprise. Ink would be too obvious, and if she saw it ahead, she may be able to snag another gown from somewhere. No, the ideal thing was to have her trust the dress was fine. So Lena locked herself in a bathroom stall and completely cut out the back panel. She patiently put it back on its hanger and zipped the bag. We left through the emergency door with the back of the dress stuffed inside Lena's purse. I completely hate people who target and steal from anyone they, Pat and her kid, calculate to be in a weaker position. The wedding was scheduled at 9 a.m. Pat called me at 7 a.m., but I ignored her calls. I picked up by 8 a.m., both curious and wondering if she suspected anything. Pat was frantic. She was crying that her dress was missing by half. I purposely made her explain, being annoyingly dense and continually interrupting like she does, installing the conversation. She asked me if I could lend her my wedding dress. I said no, sorry. She then asked me if I would help her get a dress. 
I was satisfied to remind her that the town's bridal shops were closed on Sunday, and the others that would open were almost an hour away. The farm is already almost one hour away from our town. If Pat could get a shop to rent a dress, she would need to try the dress on and get it steamed. Even if the dress was ready to wear, it would easily take more than two hours, round trip. She tried to ask me to go pick a dress. Who would pay for this? Even if a shop were open and brought her a dress, it would add to the cost. Also, these shops open at 10 or 9.30 at earliest. By time the thought they got to her, it would be time to wrap up the wedding because she needed to clear the venue by 12 o'clock for the next event. She broke down and mumbled some stupid stuff I didn't understand. So Pat hung up on me and called Lena instead. She asked Lena to bring her anything she had available. Lena and I ended up delivering the most outdated, moss-smelling, oversized dressed. Pat's disappointment was a mix between angry and emotional. She also tried to wear her knee-length silk bridal slip as a wedding dress, but it was too obvious and it really looked cheap. She tried to get her daughter to give her her own dress to wear with an open back zipper, due to fitting issues. But Casey refused, asking if she was supposed to attend the wedding naked. She got a point, plus Casey is petite. The dress needed a petticoat to plump up the skirt, which wasn't available, so it dragged all over the floor and Pat had to keep pulling it up. Pat walked down the aisle with one hand on her bouquet and another one grabbing her dress. The dress looked limp and weird with the arrangements of pins, they didn't show, that caused the sleeves and neckline to pucker into messy rims. She spent the ceremony looking uncomfortable and out of place. Very few people attended, but that was not part of any revenge, that was just how people reacted to her entitled attitude. The dress looked awful. The reception portion of the wedding had all this princely decoration. A very nice cake and a bridezilla with a dress from hell. I didn't stay, but I was told she was so disappointed she spent her wedding sulking. There was no dance, no actual speech. She had to change into a shirt and leggings because the dress was too uncomfortable. Everyone talked about how Pat put on her flip-flops and walked around aimlessly until she ordered the ushers to start folding up the chairs within one hour of the reception, so she practically kicked everyone out and the cake was never cut. Pat wasn't the same after this. She was not as loud and avoided everyone. I think she was disappointed that nobody ran to her rescue, not even her family who came from out of town. Her husband finally cracked under all the pressure and sought some help. He was slaving away and coming home to clean the house while Pat used her kids as an excuse to spend like crazy. Hank also had to do kid homework because Pat never had time or never had patience. She also refused to get a part-time job so her kids could attend an after-school and get help with their school stuff. Therapy seemed to help Hank because the last time Pat left with her kids, he didn't seem distraught. He would be riding his bicycle and could be seen more relaxed while mowing his lawn. Hank told my husband that he had contemplated suicide after their third kid. When Pat returned, he maintained the routine but was interested in going out by himself and doing things for himself. We began to see Pat alone all the time. Hank was seen less and less in the same car and eventually moved in with his parents. He filed for divorce on the grounds of emotional cruelty, and I don't think he won. Instead, I'm not sure of this because this is what I was told, there was some sort of a settlement or agreement that she would not get close or interact with him unless it has to do with the kids. I also don't know if Pat even actually suspected who what happened to her dress. She slowly pulled away from the community center and became less active in social gatherings. Pat also removed me from her Facebook as well as mostly everyone else from school and the center. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.